Okay, hello everybody and welcome to our second installment of the CBIO portal webinar. We had a great session last week and we're excited to, to be on for a second session. Uh, today's topic um, is really the interpretation of mutations and variants uh, through the mutation details tab and some other places and also the patient view. Just to remind everybody that this is part of a five session webinar series. We have three more coming up in the next, uh, on the next three Thursdays on uh, OQL and expression. Uh, the first one, the second one is group comparison. And then the last one is maybe the most advanced for those who are interested in using our API and uh, the related R client, uh, make, taking even more advantage of the powerful data in CBIO portal. Same time, same place every Thursday at 11. Just to acknowledge all the people behind CBIO Portal, it's become a very large open source project with participants from many different institutions, uh, sort of four main academic institutions, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Dana-Farber, uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and Princess Margaret in Toronto. Uh, and the main other partner is the Hive, a bioinformatics company from the Netherlands that specializes in open source software and really connects the CBIO portal software to a lot of industry partners who have in fact also contributed um, to our code base in the past and it's been it's been a very successful partnership obviously there are a lot of funders behind it a lot of past funding and a lot of the current funding uh, is from the NIH uh, AACR uh, PCF and then uh, MSK and uh, Dana Farber also contributing significantly so for today, if you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A feature to ask these questions, not the chat. Um, we will try to answer all of these questions. Uh, some of them we will uh, answer live, especially if they're uh, asked more frequently, and if we think they're particularly useful. Some, if they're simple enough, we will answer directly to the user. That will be visible to everybody. And some may just be too specialized that they're actually addressable on future webinars, so we will save them for later. Uh, we will try our best to distill all these questions and uh, update our FA FAQs. We'll try to get back to users, um, but we can't promise to get back to everybody just because of the, the volume of, of questions. Um, some of the questions may just be answered by other webinars. All of them will be recorded. Uh, if you go to the CBIO portal, .org website under tutorials. We'll get links to all the recordings of the webinars. And if you still have questions after the webinar, uh, please ask us uh, via the Google group. And that way, uh, our entire team will be able to answer and other users will also be able to benefit from these answers. So just to remind everybody a little bit of background. So the CBIO portal is really built as a platform for exploratory and interactive visual, visualization analysis and download of large scale cancer genomics data. And the goal was really here to bridge the gap between these complex data sets um, that ideally require informatic skills and then clinicians and researchers on the other side who don't necessarily have these computational skills and how do we enable um, those people to still take advantage of the data and um, make important discoveries. Um, I mentioned the open source aspect um, and then relevant for, for you is the fact that there are multiple different websites that use CBIO, the CBIO portal software. The public website that most of you are probably familiar with is hosted uh, at cbioportal.org and is preloaded with um, a lot of public data, basically all of TCGA, some ICGC, and then many, many published studies that contain sequencing data that we have curated uh, over time and made available that way. There are, in addition, private instances of this software installed at many academic uh, and commercial institutions. Um, we are aware of some, but certainly not all of them, and you may already have something running at your institution. If you don't, and you think there are internal data sets that you would like to see in there, certainly a possibility to get someone at your institutions to set up an instance. The software would be free. It would just require that someone uh, has the skills and know how to set it up and maintain it for you. Um, people always ask us about uh, uploading uh, your own data. We don't yet have a feature where you can upload a whole study, but bits and pieces you can upload uh, to make Oncoprints as well as Lollipop plots with your own data. And that's available through the Visualize Your Data page. 
we learned a couple of lessons from our first webinar last week, uh, and here are some of the answers to the most frequently asked questions on that webinar. So maybe question number one was do, whether we actually reanalyze or reprocess the original data, and the answer is no. We do not actually download the original BAM files or sequencing data. We do not reprocess. The only thing we do to the data, so we basically trust that the data is of good, high enough quality that there aren't too many false positives and false negatives, but we need to make sure that the variants, which are usually detected at the nucleotide level, are mapped to the same protein isoforms across different studies. So we remap all the variants from the nucleotide level to the same isoforms on the protein level so that uh, results across studies are at least consistent in that way. And then depending on the study, we do um, curate specific data that may or may not be, may be available for that publication. Uh, oftentimes, the only piece of data that is available are mutations. So people make it available their variants and they may only make limited clinical data available. But when, when there is more data, for example, uh, survival data, outcome data, we will capture that as well and make that available with the data. And some studies, especially the TCGA studies, have extensive additional data, including copy number alteration data, mRNA expression levels, DNA methylation levels, and in some cases, even protein and phosphoprotein levels, all of which are technically supported by a CBIO portal. It's just that for many studies, all you see is mutations and some clinical data. And maybe the last frequently asked question was, what about normal samples? How does CBIO portal use normal samples? And there's an important distinction here between um, normal blood samples or adjacent tissue that are used uh, in the studies by, for mutation calling. So um, when, whenever available, um, mutation calls are made uh, in comparison to the, the germline of that patient. So that's where the germline comes in handy, so running mutation calling against the matched normal so that we can truly report just the somatic mutations. But keep in mind that some studies don't use matched normals and those studies may have more of private SNPs that are just impossible to filter out. Uh, as far as expression, we don't currently support the display of normal mRNA expression levels in CBIO portal. So it's really only tumor RNA expression levels that are supported. And then the z-scores that we use for expression analysis and all of that will be covered in I believe the next webinar, uh, those are most often z-scores relative to uh, a population of tumor samples. In some rare cases, we have we use normal samples as, as a reference pool, but it's usually uh, tumor samples. Just a reminder of the different data sources that are in CBIO portal. So we have captured a lot of NIH data, so that's TCGA. Uh, we have some ICGC data projects like CCLE and Count Me In. Uh, AACR Genie is hosted at a different site, uh, genie.cbioportal.org. And then we've collected a lot of data from, from public sources. All of that is made available in the CBIO portal and it's supplemented by some background biological data. So there's a little bit of pathway data, there are 3D protein structures. Um, but then this is what <laughs> this webinar is mostly about today. Key question is how do you interpret all that data? We've made it really easy for people to now look at data, analyze data, but we also made it relatively easy to misinterpret the data and uh, have people come to false conclusions. And a lot of those false conclusions are simply based on the fact that um, many of the mutations that you see in cancer samples are not driver variants, meaning they don't contribute to the growth of the tumor um, or, or its aggressiveness. They're just random mutations that are along for the ride, and we call those passenger variants. And this slide here from the Broad Institute, Mike Lawrence and Gaddy Getz, nicely illustrates just the, the <clears throat> magnitude of differences in, in mutation numbers across samples in cancer. From left to right, you have different tumor types. Each dot is an individual tumor sample that was sequenced by whole exome sequencing. And the y-axis shows you the number of mutations found in each of the tumor samples normalized by the size of the genome. So it's um, number of mutations per megabase of DNA. These are just coding sequences, and these are just non-synonymous, so coding, coding changing mutations. And you can see that the tumors on the left have very low mutation burden, and those tend to be hematologic and childhood tumors. The axis, by the way, is a lock uh, 
a log scale, so it's orders of magnitude difference between the tumors on the bottom left here and those on the top right. And the tumors on the right tend to be those that are associated with uh, exogenous mutagens like the sun and melanoma or smoking and lung adenocarcinoma or lung cancers in general, uh, which just <clears throat> uh, contribute uh, to the generation of mutations. And these tumors just have a lot more mutations, but it doesn't mean that these tumors are driven by many more oncogenes or, or failure of tumor suppressors than the tumors on the left. The opposite is true, actually. But these, these are vast, the vast majority of these extra mutations are passenger variants. And the question is really, how can we interpret which one is which? How can we distinguish a driver from a passenger? And how do we make that easy for you to do in CBioPortal? portal? And that's why we've been spending a lot of time over the last couple of years to add annotation sources into CBioPortal portal to make that part easier. <clears throat> and they're really <clears throat> divided into three different groups. The first one is um, a lot is known about specific mutations. So can we curate that? Can we use curated data about these mutations so that uh, we can recognize these already known variants? And we use three different sources in CBioPortal. portal. The first one is OncoKB, which is a database maintained uh, by Memorial Sloan Kettering. Second one is Civic, which is maintained by Washington University in St. Louis. And the third is My Cancer Genome from Vanderbilt University. Um, <clears throat> those are built into the CBIO portal and show you whether a mutation is a driver or not, or at least a likely driver or not. We also have predicted functional effect from a couple of different sources, including um, mutation assessor, polyphen, and SIFT. And then sometimes the most powerful thing is actually just recurrence. Has a variant been, been seen before? And here we rely on two sources, Cosmic and Cancer Hotspots. <clears throat> which is available at cancerhotspots.org and can give you information about the recurrence of specific mutations at the amino acid level. So just to show you, and I'll show all of that live in a few minutes, but what that looks like in, um, in the CBIO portal. So this is a view of ERBB2 uh, queried across different, um, different uh, cancer types in the MSK impact clinical sequencing cohort that was published in Nature Medicine in 2017. And you can see where in the um, protein the, the, the mutations fall with the most recurrent mutation here at S310, uh, a couple of recurrent mutations in the kinase domain. And then there's a tabular view below that shows you um, whether or not a mutation is a driver. And you can see, and I'll show all of that live, but you can see the different annotation sources here in CBIO portal, along with many other details that we'll, we'll go through. Um, <clears throat> This is maybe a great example to show how easy it is to misinterpret um, cancer mutations. So when you query a data set like lung adenocarcinoma, where there's a very high mutation uh, background, you can find a lot of genes that are, that are mutated at very high frequencies. And if you just plot all these mutations across uh, a couple of genes, you can see many mutations in these samples, many missense mutations in green, many truncating mutations in black. Um, but um, when you turn on the, uh, the driver or VUS annotation of CBIO portal, this changes rather quickly. Now, everything that is light green, pale, is what, um, according to our knowledge, is, is a variant of unknown significance. So all of these mutations are likely to be passenger events, uh, not drivers. Only the, the dark green ones, so these KRAS mutations, as well as the dark black ones, which are truncating mutations in known tumor suppressor genes, uh, and then the brown ones here, the indels and EGFR, only those are really to, uh, believed to be true drivers. And with a simple additional filter, you can actually now remove all the VUSs and you can see all of a sudden you have a lot fewer driver variants left. And I'll show you how to use all of that in, in the live demo. Uh, the reason behind a lot of these presumed passenger mutations is simply that they occur often in very long genes. So one of the examples in the previous Oncoprint was PCLO, which is an a gene that is longer than 5,000 amino acids um, and just randomly accumulates a lot of mutations. It's a very long gene. KRAS is just a couple of hundred amino acids long, has a, a lot less potential for acquiring these random mutations. Um, another example is ALK, which we know is involved in gene fusions in lung cancer, but it's also just randomly mutated by mutations uh, all across its amino acid sequence. And another reason, uh, ALK is relatively long, but another reason that it um, uh, accumulates these mutations is because it's often also not expressed in, um, 
lung cancer and therefore acquires more mutations simply because when there's no negative selection against mutations that uh, might um, disrupt the gene and also because there's no transcription coupled repair since the gene is not expressed. So these are all little caveats to look out for when, when looking at these mutations. And with that uh, introduction, um, I will switch to a live demo of CBAR portal. Just keep in mind, I think that was also uh, a little bit of feedback we got from the first um, uh, webinar. Some of this may go a little too quickly for some users, but I think it's more important to have seen what's possible than at this very moment understanding exactly how to redo it. Um, just um, knowing that what you can do at this point might be more important. Uh, you can always go back and view the recording um, and then uh, look back at how this was done or email us and ask us questions. And I guess another piece of advice, don't spend too much time looking through the Q&A now. Um, yes, there might be some questions you are also have and that, that might get answered, but it's probably better to pay attention to, to this now than, than going through the, the Q&A. So I have a couple of um, examples lined up here, and there'll hopefully be time at the end to, uh, and to give some other examples directly related to, to questions that you may have. The first one is rather simple. So this is the homepage. When you get to the homepage, this is what you see on the public portal. You have pan cancer studies on top, cell lines uh, below, and then uh, studies sorted by tumor type below. I'm gonna actually go with the very first study, which is the MSK impact clinical sequencing cohort. That is the first 10,000 or so sequenced tumor samples from, from MSK. I'm going to do a query by gene. Uh, and just type in one gene. We already looked at the ERBB2 lollipop in my slide deck. I'm just gonna query that gene across all samples. These samples are now a mix of different cancer types. Um, the Oncoprint tab, which is the default to load first, is not that informative. It just tells you that ERBB2 is altered in 7%, uh, mostly by amplification. Those are the tall red bars but then also by different types of mutations and sometimes mutations sitting on top of amplifications. Um, we'll get back into the Oncoprint view later, but the next relevant tab here is, is the cancer type summary tab, which can fairly quickly give you a very good assessment uh, of the alteration rate of a given gene across different cancer types. Um, by, by default, this plot is limited to cancer types for which we have 10 or more samples. You can change that. I'm going to actually change it here. You can use the slider or you can just type in a number. So I'm going to change this to 50 just to make sure that these numbers are, 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 are robust. Now, and now what you see at the bottom is a simple bar chart, which you can, if you want, just download as an SVG or a PNG or a PDF. If you want to use that in a publication, SVG and PDF are obviously great for further editing if you want to edit them um, for, for publications or other purposes. And the bar chart now tells you the, the frequency of alterations in different cancer types, where at the top you have uh, esophagogastric cancer, which has a 25% alteration rate of RB2. Next is breast cancer uh, with about 18%, followed by bladder with 17 So you get the frequency, but you also get another nice aspect here, which is the types of alterations. So in gastric cancer, it's mostly amplifications, which is the red part of the bar. Uh, and then some mutations and it's somewhat reversed in bladder cancer where you have more mutations than amplifications and then the, the bottom here you have um you have events that are where samples have two events in the same uh, sample so it could be an amplification and a mutation and that's that part of the bar and then you can see here it's the, the the tail of the distribution so a couple some cancer types have very low rates uh, of alterations I'll come back to the cancer type summary in a second, but the next most important tab here is the mutations detail tab, which uh, tells you everything about all the mutations observed in this data set. So you get this lollipop plot that I looked at earlier. You see the 1,255 amino acids of RB2 uh, strung out linearly. You can see domains annotated, so the kinase domain is shown in yellow here. You can see other domains. Uh, these are all extracellular. We don't currently have, I wish we had, is to show you where the transmembrane domain is. It's somewhere around here, at about 650 to 700 amino acids. Um, 
And then you can see this the frequency of mutations in this data set, just simply counting. And you can see this the tallest lollipop here is sitting at S310. And it tells you there are 59 mutations at that amino acid. If you click on that, the table below updates and shows you only those 59 mutations. And you can see there's S310F and S310Ys. And you can see which cancer types they occur in. And I'll get back to these annotation columns in a second. You can unselect this. Um, one really useful uh, uh, feature here is that the fact that these, the diagram and the table are linked and you can actually search for specific events using this search feature, which is available in many different places of CBIO portal and, and very useful. So if you, for example, you wanted to know what the lollipop diagram for lung cancer looks like, you just type in lung and it filters it. So you can see um, the mutations are mostly in the kinase domain and they're actually mostly colored here in brown uh, in frame uh, insertions and deletions uh, in the kinase domain. If you type in breast, picture changes, you see, again, mostly kinase domain mutations, but a little bit of a switch. There are still some indels here, but you see more missense mutations uh, at, specific muta at specific positions. Bladder looks like this. Very few kinase domain mutations uh, and, and many extracellular mutations, in particular the S310F. And maybe the last one is colorectal, which looks a little bit more like all over the place. And interestingly, has a couple of these R678Q mutations, which are right uh, at or near the transmembrane domain. So that's one nice feature uh, about, the, about this view. Um, another one worth mentioning is the fact that we support 3D structures. Um, of course, it's not always possible to crystallize an entire protein. So in the case of ERBB2, you have uh, crystal structures of the extracellular domain, and there are different ones you can pick from here. Mouse over tells you details about each of these structures uh, as supplied by PDB. And then there are kinase domain uh, structures. So I, in this case, I'm just going to pick a kinase domain structure. And then this view here is fully interactive. You can zoom, you can pan. The, color in the colors indicate where in the protein mutations occur. So all green regions are missense mutations, all um, uh, brown regions are in-frame deletions. And if you want to pick a, an individual one, you can show the side chain. And you can, using the shift key, you can even show um, uh, multiple mutations at the same time. And in this particular example, you can see these two mutations are actually quite far apart in linear space, but in three-dimensional space, they actually are closer together than maybe you would expect. So those are all, those are features that are available using this little 3D view. Um, while I'm at this, there are also other annotation tracks. So you can look at um, post-translational modifications. So these are known PTM sites uh, that we um, have pulled in from DBPTM. So it shows you where there are phosphorylation sites in green, ubiquitination, methylation, protein methylation, and then glycosylation sites in, um, in the RBB2. There are other tracks for related to cancer hotspots in OncoKB, and I'll get to that in, in a second. If you look further at this, this table below, so it shows you for each mutation the sample ID. It shows you how many other mutations are present in the sample, which could be useful. Um, it shows you the cancer type, and then the protein change, and then the meat of what we want to get at today is, is the annotation, where we use different sources to tell you whether or not that particular mutation is a known or likely driver. In the case of L755P, you have four different annotation sources that tell you that this is a, a driver. First one is OncoKB, which reports that this is a known oncogenic mutation. Um, biological effect is described here as gain of function, and you have PubMed IDs describing why this is a gain of function mutation. Um, we also have from OncoKB the level of therapeutic evidence here. So in this case, this is um, a mutation that sensitizes to uh, trastuzumab um, in non sponsored lung cancer with the reference for it. And uh, then we also have annotation from Civic, um, from My Cancer Genome, and link outs can take you to more information about, about those. And then we also tell you that it's this this particular amino acid is mutated recurrently as inferred by the cancer hotspots method. And there's a link to the paper and a link to the website here. 
And those two, the, 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 the former, the, the OncoKB and Cancer Hotspots are also available uh, as tracks here. So I can uh, add these tracks and you can now see in RB2, in this data set, these are the amino acids that match uh, annotations from Cancer Hotspots and or OncoKB. So telling you in a sense what, what, what it's sort of intuitive to see here that the mutations that are more recurrent, and I can zoom into the axis here to, to show a little bit more of that, that lower end signal here. Those are the ones that are more likely to be the drivers. And then the mutations that are sort of everywhere sitting between, um, between these hotspots, those are probably the ones that are um, passenger mutations. And we classify them as, as VUSs here. In addition to the annotation column, we also have information about obviously just the mutation type. Uh, for TCGA in particular, we, we know the copy number status of that gene in that sample. Um, so you can assess whether that mutation is, occurs in a diploid context, like in the first sample here, or in an amplified context, like in the second case. We have counts from COSMIC. And this, the L755 is in COSMIC 35 times. You get the allele frequency of that mutation in that tumor sample. Uh, in this case, it's a 7% allele frequency, but when you hover over, you also get the total coverage at that locus. So not surprisingly here, the mutation that occurs in the amplified setting has a much higher coverage with 1,856 reads supporting uh, the locus and 799 supporting the, the variant. And this one is much lower at 191 total coverage. There are some additional uh, columns that are hidden by default. So including things like HG, VS annotation, which could be useful if you want to link that, if you want to uh, just copy and paste that. Uh, we have the predicted functional impact uh, from a couple of different sources, including mutation assessor, um, SIFT, and Polyphen. Um, so in this case here, they are predicted to be um, deleterious, which we, we, we hide these by default because we don't always think that they're all that useful for oncogenes in particular, they might be much more useful for tumor suppressors. So in this case, we know that these mutations are, are activating. So the, the, the prediction that this is a deleterious mutation is a little misleading uh, in, in the case of, of these oncogenes. So that's why we hide them by default. And um, if you want to see the chromosome position, the actual nucleotide change underlying the mutation, that's available as well. So you just activate these columns. Sometimes we quickly copy uh, and paste this from C -bio portal into say IGV to jump to the locus of, of that location. So that's, that's possible. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm forgetting anything here. There are nomad frequencies, DB SNP information, exon number. So a lot more is, is, is hidden in here. And for us, it's always the challenge, basically, like how much information do we provide by default? How much do we hide? How much do we make available to power users who know where to look for it uh, when they need it? <clears throat> and we don't want to confuse uh, other users. So it's always, it's always a balance uh, that we're trying to, to maintain here. Um, so now that I've introduced the, the ability of CBioPortal to distinguish between drivers and VUSs, I'm going to show you how to potentially apply those in other places. And the very first place to apply this to is um, in the cancer type summary or in general across all these, 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 these tabs. Um, so what you're looking at here is the, the alteration frequency uh, across different cancer types, uh, looking at all mutations. So in melanoma, for example, uh, the mutation frequency is 3.01% and the overall frequency is 4.38%. But that includes all the variants, including uh, presumed passengers. With one little click here on this filter button, you can actually exclude all mutations and copy number alterations of unknown significance from the counts and from the visualizations. And when I click that, um, the chart will update and remove all those events. So you can see gastric cancer hasn't moved much, uh, but some of these other cancers may have moved a little bit. Uh, and melanoma, which I picked out as an example earlier, is actually now went from 3% mutation frequency to just 0.5% uh, mutation frequency, meaning most of the mutations in RB2 found in melanoma were presumed to just be passenger events. And so therefore the, 
the frequency is, is now lower than, than before. So that's, uh, I'll get back to that feature in, in other examples later. Um, just one more piece to show. So this mutation lollipop is obviously only available right now for uh, data that's already in CBioPortal, but we have a way to um, visualize data from, from other sources. So if you go to the Visualize Your Data tab, at the bottom you have access to two different tools that we've built that are sort of standalone, standalone tools to uh, visualize data. The second one is Mutation Mapper. When you click on that, it's a very simple interface where you can basically copy and paste your own mutation data. We support three different example, uh, data formats. We support genomic changes, um, which is an example here. We support, if you don't have the actual nucleotide changes in the genome, you can just put in protein changes and you can even put them both together. But if you just had, say, this example, you would type in your cases, you would hit visualize, and then you would get different lollipops for your different genes of interest. Same way you would see them directly in CBioPortal, with all the same annotation sources and everything. As a next uh, step here, I wanted to walk you through um, a more complex query. Um, I will again pick the MSK impact study. I'm going to not use the query by gene feature, but I'm going to use the explore feature. You can either click this button or just click on the pie chart next to the study. So that will take me to the study view, which we introduced last week, which summarizes different clinical as well as genomic aspects of, of this cohort. In the example that I'm picking, I'm really just interested in, in lung adenocarcinoma. And so I'm selecting that. There are about there are 1,357 samples. You get an idea of the most frequently mutated genes in lung adenocarcinoma, P33, KRAS, EGFR. These are the fusion genes. Uh, and then down here you have deleted genes. You can now either start clicking genes and they will show up appear, or you can also just type genes in. I'm gonna just type because it's a little faster and I can get the genes in the order that I want them in. Um, I'm gonna select receptor tyrosine kinases, RAS, uh, RAF, uh, and then map kinase genes, just to give you an idea of basically the different genes in this, in this uh, cascade that are frequently mutated in lung adenocarcinoma. I hit query, and now the portal will take me to our standard set of results tab, where the first tab that will load is the Oncoprint tab, which shows you uh, the 10 or so query genes that I've sele uh, selected. And then from left to right, it shows you the, um, the, the cancer samples. And then in each cell, and if you zoom in, you can see that this Oncoprint is really a giant matrix where it's a, it's genes are in rows and patients are in columns and patients with multiple samples are actually superimposed into one cell. And it shows you basically for each, in each cell, how that gene is altered in that particular sample. Um, you can zoom in and out here and basically see the entire um, spectrum of alterations across your code. You can see that EGFR is altered in 30% by mostly mutations, different types of mutations, as well as amplifications. Same is true for RB2 and MET, lower frequency but similar pattern. And then the three genes, RET, ROS, and ALK, are those that are often involved in fusion events in, in lung cancer. And then you have KRAS, NRAS, NF1, which is usually affected by truncating mutations, sometimes by deletions, the tall blue bars here, and then BRAF and MAP2K1. Um, I'm gonna add one clinical track here, and that's the mutation count. And that is to highlight, in some sense, the correlation between uh, differences in mutation count, and you can see the up and down of mutation count. You can see some samples like these over here have a higher mutation burden. This group of samples has a higher mutation burden, low, high, low, high, and you can maybe begin to appreciate that there's a correlation between the color coding here and these mutations. And what you're looking at is basically dark green mutations are known uh, mutations. These are known drivers or likely drivers. And light green mutations are variants of unknown significance. Uh, and you can see oftentimes these VUSs are, occur in a higher mutation burden. That is especially true in RET, ROS, and ALK, 
which are genes that are often involved in fusions, they're actually not usually expressed in the lung unless they come under the control of a different promoter through fusion. And therefore, we see these um, uh, VUSs often in high mutation burden. And we also see a lot of overlap here. So there's, there's a lot of mutual exclusivity across the cascade, which makes sense. All of these genes are in the same cascade, activate the same downstream processes. There's really no biological need to have multiple of them turned on at the same time. And you, but you can see that especially KRAS overlaps a lot of these um, high TMB uh, two, uh, samples with, with these VUSs. Uh, another look at, <clears throat> at these is, um, is uh, the, the lollipop plot. So you can see EGFR mutations are nicely clustered in and around the kinase domain, a little bit of extracellular therapy too we looked at. So this now looks familiar to you. But if you look at RET loss and ALK, the three fusion genes, you can see um, mutations basically show up everywhere. If you select just the missense mutations, there are two that, uh, according to Uncle KB, are, are known or likely drivers, but none of the other ones are. And this a similar picture emerges in, in ROS and ALK. If you tune out the fusions and just look at missense, in this case, there's one. Uh, and in the case of ALK, there is one as well. So not much here. Uh, <clears throat> and if you go back to the oncoprint, you can actually, um, using that same filter that I showed earlier, just exclude the VUSs. And when you do that, um, you can, you, a much cleaner picture emerges with much better mutual exclusivity between the different events. Um, and that's really what I wanted to show for the, for the oncoprint view and how to use um, driver annotations in the oncoprints. Um, any of those driver changes that I make here uh, apply to all the different tabs, which is why this little warning message shows up everywhere that there is filtering in place. Just keep that in mind. But it also means you can use it in any other downstream <clears throat> comparisons and reviews. So if you were to look at survival differences, this, this would be reflected in, in that as well. In my next example, I'm just picking, um, keep in mind, you can always search easily here. So instead of browsing through the list, I'm looking directly for the study that I want by typing it. So I'm looking for the TCGA endometrial carcinoma study that was published in Nature in 2013. I'm gonna query by gene, and I'm going to select just two genes, KRAS and NRAS. Again, these are two genes that are functionally equivalent. We don't expect uh, both of them to be mutated in, a, in an individual tumor sample. One should be sufficient to activate the downstream processes. Um, in this case, you're looking at 22% KRAS frequency and 4% NRAS. There are a couple of VUSs here in KRAS, and that probably has to do with the fact that there is some hypermutation going on. Yeah, these are probably polymerase epsilon mutant tumors. This, is, this one's one with 10,000 samples, uh, 10,000 mutations, another one with 6,000. Um, there's one deletion of NRAS, which is probably not a biologically re relevant event. So again, if you want to eliminate those, you can exclude the VUSs with this one click, and now you get a much cleaner picture, no more overlap, with one exception. There's actually one sample here that has both an NRAS and a KRAS driver mutation. You can click on this case by just simply clicking on the ID, which takes you to the patient view, which is the next uh, piece that I wanted to introduce here. And this patient view now really summarizes everything there is to know or that everything that CBioPortal knows about this particular case both clinically and genomically. Um, so let's ignore for a fact why we picked this case, but so basically uh, what you're looking at here is a summary of genomics. You can see the copy number pattern of this, this tumor sample. There's a gain on chromosome 1Q shown in red, but a small deletion on 2Q. This very this looks like diploid on three through seven. There's a little deletion on eight and so forth. There's a couple of events on the X chromosome. And there are 208 mutations scattered across the genome. Keep in mind, this is a TCGA sample, so this is whole exome sequencing. What we looked at earlier was targeted sequencing with fewer mutations, uh, fewer mutations detected. And then we have clinical data for the case uh, at the patient level as well as at the sample level. Uh, in the case of TCGA, we have the original pathology, pathology reports, which are scanned and de-identified, so you can 
see read details about each of these cases. In this case, the diagnosis is scribbled on in, in, in handwritten. And then also for TCGA and, and others, local installations may have this too. We have actually the support for um, histology slides. Um, in this case, this is with our uh, using Cancer Digital Slide Archive, which is maintained by, by Emory. So you can look at these, these images. And if you know what you're looking at, you can maybe interpret these. But back to the genomics of this case. Um, so remember we picked this case because it had an NRAS and a KRAS mutation. Um, I showed earlier that we have allele frequencies available for each mutation. And I didn't mention this plot here at the top right, which summarizes basically the distribution of allele frequencies in that tumor sample. In a perfectly pure tumor sample where every mutation is in one copy of each, uh, uh, each gene in, in, and in each cell, you would get one perfect peak at around 0.5. In this case, we actually have two peaks, which suggests that there is uh, there are differences in clonality, that maybe there is a subclone here that has a few more mutations at this is the peak at 0.2%. And if you look closely at the different, um, at the different mutations here, you can see the NRAS mutation is in 0.19% of the reads. The PIK3CA is in 0.38, KRAS in 0.21. So you can clearly see these two numbers here, around 0.2 and around 0.4. The second D1, maybe at around 0.5. But what this suggests, we don't, we don't know for sure, but it suggests that this tumor has basically two subclones, where two subclones. The trunk of the tumor is PIK3CA and Cyclin D1 muta mutated, but then it has an NRAS and a KRAS mutant subclone. Again, we don't know for sure, but it's a hypothesis that, it, the hypothesis that you can derive from this data. So probably what's going on is that there, there's an NRAS-driven subclone and a KRAS-driven subclone in this tumor sample, which would explain why we see both of them occur at the same time. There are a couple of other examples of the patient view. So this is a patient view um, that has exactly one tumor sample. We also have a couple uh, with multiple. Uh, for this example, I will pick um, the UCSF glioma study and go to the patient view. In order for me to more quickly find the patient, I'm selecting the subset of um, tumor is uh, the, the subset of, of patients for which there are four samples available. There are exactly three patients that match that criterion and a total of 12 samples. This little button is quite useful. It takes you from the study view to the patient view of the selected patients. In this case, this will line up the three patients that I've selected and there'll be a little selector at the top that allows you to toggle between patients one, two, and three, either using the arrows or even typing in numbers here. So the first case that I've selected here is um, a patient, um, a 22-year-old glioma patient uh, with four different samples, one primary uh, astrocytoma, and then three recurrent uh, recurrences. Uh, when available, the, the portal has the ability to, to make these, to draw these nice timelines, so you can look at uh, the timing of these different tumors. So time of diagnosis is time zero when the first sample was taken. And then we have almost like an average every year or so uh, another sample profile. You can see how the patients were treated. In this case, the patient received uh, temozolomide uh, chemotherapy at two different times and also some radiation therapy. And then you can see how the tumor evolves. So you can appreciate that the first sample has a lower mutation burden with just 12 mutations, and the last one has 55 mutations, so quadrupled the number of mutations. All four tumors have in common the fact that they are IDH1 mutant, R132C, which again are known mutations according to all sources. Uh, they also have a P53 mutation, the R248Q. You can see the allele frequencies in each of the tumors holding pretty steady. Um, but then you can see that really samples, sample four in particular, and there are more columns to show here, and you can sort this any different way if you want to sort it by number of by the samples. You can see samples three and four, and particularly number four really has a lot of extra mutations, probably linked to the, the treatment in this case. Um, 
the genomic evolution track is something we're evolving right now. It's going to be much more useful once we have cell-free DNA data in, in CBioPortal, but you can then you can use this to look at individual mutations over time uh, and sort of customize this graph as well. There's also a heat map view for that. We won't have time to get into that today, but it'll be a useful uh, feature, especially once more cell-free DNA becomes available on, uh, on, on patients. The second case here, just to highlight another case, um, um, another case with four mutations, and the third case. So just to highlight that feature. And then um, maybe I have one more case here that I wanted to show. Of course, I can't find that now. Just gonna bring that in from a different window. And that's just another case where we have even more treatment data. So this is um, a, a prostate uh, cancer case from the Count Be In uh, Metastatic Prostate Cancer Project. Uh, and you can see a lot of different treatment over the span of five years. There's nothing directly targetable here uh, in, in these mutations. But another feature that, that we have for prostate cancer, for example, is we have PSA levels that we can show uh, on the timeline. And, um, you see how the, the, the little bubble here gets bigger with rising PSA levels as an indicator of disease progression. And I think so that I can show, so I can maybe answer some questions, we can end the live demo part now and go to the Q&A. Maybe Tali, you can summarize some questions. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Nikki. That was great. Um, and thank you to everyone that's here. We've gotten a lot of questions. We've done our best to answer um, as, as many as we've been able to uh, along the way. Um, but let me just ask a couple questions now, um, kind of common questions that we've seen a fair bit. Um, and one of them has been, um, we've seen this a few times, how do you know if a mutation is heterozygous or homozygous? Can you know that um, from the data that we have? Right, do, do you have a, an example in mind? Do you want me to I do not. One? I was thinking we could do a little theoretical discussion. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so, so we, we don't know for sure, mainly because that's a very complex, um, complex, let's actually pick one example here. Sorry, TCGA ovarian. This was another example that I was hoping to be able to show. We actually showed it briefly last time. Um, Let's look at the TCGA ovarian data set again. We showed it last time, but I want to hit two birds with one stone here. I didn't show the germline annotation, which is another layer of variant interpretation, so I can show that here at the same time. So BRCA1, BRCA2 are mutated in ovarian cancer. And uh, you can see uh, in this case, the, the mutations with a little dash through them are germline. So that's another annotation layer that I didn't show earlier, mainly because most studies in CBioPortal don't have germline information for privacy reasons, but this particular study has it because of the importance of BRCA1 and BRCA2. And if we only show BRCA1 and BRCA2, then you can't re-identify a patient. So the, the, the germline annotation is also shown in the patient view over here. And of course, now I picked a bad study, <laughs> and, but it's another good example, I guess, because the data in CBioPortal is only as good as the annotation uh, source. So in this case, for some reason, we're missing variant allele frequencies, um, which is why I can't show you, um, which is why I can't show you that, that part, um, but I think if I go back, and switch to, come on. Switch to the PanCan Atlas version of this data, which may not have all the germline data, but uh, will have more um, mutation data. Yeah, germline data are not here, but in this case, we. We have allele frequencies in the tumor. Um, and 
you can see here now, these are all the different truncating mutations in BRCA1 in ovarian cancer. And you can use for TCGA, we have the luxury of having these shallow or heterozygous loss deletion calls, which you can use. Keep in mind, they're not perfect, they're automated, and they're heavily dependent on thresholds and therefore heavily dependent on tumor purity. But you can use those. And you can look at the allele frequency in each uh, of each mutation. This is now the allele frequency of that mutation in the tumor sample. And um, that becomes even more informative once you put it in context uh, with all other mutations in that sample. And I'm gonna jump here to the patient view um, for that case. It's taking a while to load. Wouldn't be a live demo without something going wrong. There we go. All right. So in this case, actually, yeah, that's a nice, nice example. You can see the distribution of mutation frequencies is, is all over the place, which makes this a little hard to assess. But what's clear to see is that, for example, the RB1 mutation is at 97%, meaning it looks like there's no normal RB1 left in the sample. The same is true for the P53 mutation, which is at 92%. But now that puts the BRCA mutation into perspective because that number is at around 50%, suggesting that there's some normal BRCA left in this, in this sample. So there's no, there's no very easy answer to this question, <laughs> but you can infer looking at the different uh, the copy number calls, especially in TCGA, TCGA, TCGA samples, the allele frequency of that particular mutation and the allele frequency of all other mutations in the sample, and you can sort of piece it together. Thanks, Nikki. Um, and just to kind of emphasize, because we've had a few questions on this as well, um, the example you just showed with the germline, um, that information is really as provided by the study, right? That's not something we're making any calls about. That's really, if the study is called something as germline, then we'll annotate it that way. Is correct. That correct? And it'll, yes, and there'll be, there'll be very few studies that have any germline information, and certainly not a single study that will have germline information in all genes, in all samples. Um, so we've also had, this is um, not exactly related to the topic for today, but we've had a couple questions about how to cite um, data, and I want to make sure we cover that because um, that's really important. So can you just remind everyone what to do if you're citing something from CBioPortal? Portal? <laughs> Right, so we want, to, we want to make sure that the original source of the data is cited. So for every um, data set we have, you can see it here, the little uh, bookmark link. So if you say, wanted to cite this BGI study because you use that in your analysis, you, would, you should at least cite that paper. And we have it linked here. <clears throat> and then in addition, we're always happy if we get cited. So um, if you cite the website, that's fine. Even better, you cite the, the manuscripts. Um, so Sarami et al, Gao et al are really the main two publications describing CBIO portal. So if you can cite those, that would be great. And the other question we always get is, yes, you can absolutely uh, use the images directly from CBIO portal, which is why we make them available so easy, easily. You don't have to screenshot them. You can download them. As PDFs, SVGs, PNGs, please use them, please modify them. And yeah, cite us. Absolutely. So another question, we've gotten a few, a uh, couple versions of this have been general questions about non-coding mutations and whether or not those are present um, in CBIO portal. Yeah, they're, 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 they're generally not present, mainly because they're very tricky to deal with. <clears throat> and uh, uh, also because there aren't many sources that, that have them. There are, however, some, there well, was one good, a good exception here, so I'm gonna show you the, um, the TERT promoter is probably the, the best known non-coding mutation out there, the best known frequent, recurrent, well understood um, mutation. And we do support that in CBIO portal. I'm running a query here for TERT, mutations across all samples in, in MSK Impact. I guess this is 
taking a while too, but, but basically for, for TERT, we have an exception where we recognize it and we display it. We don't have any others right now that are displayed that way, but as recurrent mutations become more important and better understood, we will have ways to add them to CBIO portal. I guess there are two types of non-coding mutations. One is, are those that are maybe even silent in intron, in exons. Those should be at least accessible in, in more studies and we could bring those in if, if needed. But then there are also those that are in promoters or enhancers far away from the exons, which are typically more difficult to capture. And so then even if we knew about the mutations, most of the data sets that we're working with may not have them uh, annotated. So here is um, it's actually loaded, the third promoter, uh, is, TERT is altered in 15% of samples, and all of these light blue ones here are promoter mutations that we have specifically annotated for TERT. And actually, in this case, the MSK impact assay specifically expanded the coverage of the, the, the promoter of TERT to capture those mutations. So TCGA, for example, we wouldn't have those unless we had only in a subset that was whole genome sequence, for example. Great, thanks, Nikki. Um, so we've got another question about uh, whether or not, is there a way to tell from within CBIO portal if a somatic variant is the result of tumor only sequencing or tumor normal uh, variant calling? Could you maybe touch on that? Good question. <laughs> Our portal is, is evolving quickly, so I may not actually have the most up-to-date answer on this. Um, for did, did you have an answer in mind, Tali? Yeah, no, I, I think my, my answer was really just that um, it's something we're, we're thinking a lot about and we're working on, but the best way to find that out is really to look at the original publication um, right. and see what they did, because um, we do take the data, as Nikki, I know, said earlier, we take the data as it's kind of given in the study. Um, so your best bet is really to look at the original data set, uh, the original publication. Right. So what, and I think what we should be doing is we should collect that at the study level um, directly. So for example, what's not shown in this table yet is what type of sequencing was used to detect mutations. Um, we have that information, especially when it was panel sequencing. We know whether a study was panel sequencing and we know uh, which genes were included down to the level of each sample, even if, if there were different panels used across different samples in a study, we have that information. So I think what we want to do is expand that to whole exome and whole genome sequencing, annotate those as well, and then also annotate whether or not a match normal was used. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so maybe um, one last question, because um, we are running out of time, but this is a really important one, is how do you avoid analyzing the same sample twice? Because the same samples, there are kind of multiple studies um, that might have the same samples in them. So do you want to kind of demonstrate how we, we try to help people not do that? <laughs> right, yeah, that's, that's always been a, a tricky one. So we, we have no easy way to completely eliminate uh, overlapping samples. But um, for example, yeah, just random, let me just undo this. Uh, let's see, TCGA breast is a good one. So you can see there are now four different studies uh, for TCGA breast cancer samples. One is for the first publication um, in Nature 2012. The second one is uh, Cell 2015. And uh, a couple of others, the legacy Firehose data plus the PanCan Atlas. But just to keep it simple, uh, we can do these two. And if I just query one gene in those two, um, studies, CBioPortal will now just simply go by sample ID or patient ID and not count mutations that occur in the same sample, not count them twice. They will be displayed twice in this table here, but they will only show up once in the lollipop at that particular <clears throat> position. Is that the answer you had in mind, Tali, or do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, that, that's it. I guess I would also point out that on the when you were selecting those studies, we did provide a warning to say, hey, you're selecting studies that share data. Um, so we do also try to warn you up front. But um, yeah, I think we, we try to kind of cover both both levels of it. So yeah, and we do it at the, the, the naming of the sample and the patient. And if 
for some reason, the same patient is in two studies using different IDs, then we're unfortunately out of luck and we can't catch that. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, I think we are definitely out of time. So thank you so much, Nikki, that was terrific. Um, I think we, um, we have done our best to answer all of your questions. Thank you to everyone that attended and all of the questions that you asked. Um, and uh, see you next time. Thank you, everybody.